Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For being here. So um, I wanted to explain the title here because I, I think baited you in, into coming here by telling you that we're going to repurpose computation, non-strategic computation for strategic com computation no, purposes. And one of the things I was thinking is that really a better title and one that's more appropriate for this week, for this talk, is Really thinking about beyond worst case adversaries, because you know this is this is the week about sequential decision makings in all forms, from strategic to adversarial, and we are going to think about them and really think about both statistical and computational challenges. The focus of the talk is what it was before. Just wanted to make sure the title is something that you can you can see the connection immediately with what we are going to be talking about. So. The idea is how are we going to think about batch optimization and learning after a week of having thought about sequential decision making? Okay, so we are quite used to thinking about optimization happening in batch because it's actually something that we have decades of work and kind of decades of machine learning has built upon that idea. So, what is the main idea here? The idea is that one of the questions we want to answer in learning theory is that. What are the concepts that can be learned from data and how many observations? And data usually comes in the batch format, the data sets that we have, we have something Z1 to ZM, then we put it into some optimization. Um, that optimization routine will try to find a function, maybe from a set of prefix set of functions that fits the data as best as possible. And then it will spit out the function and I'll take that function and forever in the future, we'll use this function for any other prediction I want to do. And really the idea behind why this makes sense in what world we should actually think about machine learning as this kind of a pipeline is that the data, which is this data that we are trying to learn from, that data itself is generated from a distribution and this distribution is remaining the same. So we have really a nice world, another way to put it, an IID world, and that's why we, for decades, we have tried to understand how we can get a data set, optimize something over it, or learn something for it. And this is really ubiquitous uh, to optimization and learning and prediction in general. Um, some of you might be more uh, comfortable thinking about binary classification. Uh, for example, of, of perhaps physical or abstract objects. Uh, for example, uh, knowing whether pictures of chairs and tables is telling them apart, or uh, given uh, spam or emails, being able to say if an email is a spam or not, or given a review, knowing if it's fake or not. So those are binary prediction tasks that fall in here if we think about the data as remaining stationary. Or you might be more comfortable thinking about general sort of best fit type regression functions. So you might be more comfortable thinking about, I want to be able to predict uh, the demand, or I want to be able to learn or predict how to set reserve prices. Um, these are all prediction tasks. And as long as we think the world is a, a stochastic world where data sets are generated IID, we have used this formula of taking a data set, optimizing something over it um, to, to essentially learn and optimize. Now, what's happened and why we have heard so much about sequential decision-making and uh, learning is that that assumption that the world remains stationary and nice and IID is less and less the case the more these algorithms actually enter the practical domain because learning algorithms and environments are interacting and they're interacting in many different ways that makes the data evolve 
sometimes the data is just evolving because the environment is evolving in unpredictable ways or unpredictable um, sort of um, for, for unpredictable reasons that uh, we cannot account for. Um, that, that could be something like a stock market. But also, a lot of times, it's evolving because of some adversarial manipulation or other strategic manipulations. For example, uh, sometimes content, um, like in YouTube um, content or your, uh, the spam box, you know, uh, the content is created to pass through a filter. And you might keep changing this filter, but people who are generating this content also want to get around the filter and get the spam into your mailbox or get the video uh, to pass through the, the quality control and be posted. So those are some adversarial manipulations. There are also broadly other strategic manipulations that I'm not going to focus too much about, but I think it's important to still note. For example, things that aren't super malicious, but they're still somebody changing their data because of the benefit that it has for them. Like in Uber or Lyft, you might, um, if you're uh, looking for a ride, you might change the location of where you're requesting the ride. Or if you're a driver, you might sort of decline some of the rides in the hope of getting better, better deal out of things. But importantly, the sequential nature of these um, problems is the reason we want to study sequential decision making. And I also want to study sequential decision making. Um, and the way I'm going to view sequential decision making is very similar to what you've seen already a lot in this semester. But I wanted to still establish this common perspective in case you just need a refresher. So this is sequential as being perceived as being adversarial, model of online learning or online optimization with full information. So one way to think about this is that I have T interactions with um, between a learner and the world, and the world is an adaptive adversary. The learner at every round picks some kind of a function. This could be the prediction function if you want to think about sort of the binary classification. Um, and then the environment will uh, react to it and usually select some adversarial, like adversarially chosen instance and shows it. The learner gets a loss and then also gets to see what was chosen by the adversary. And the idea is that we want to get a regret uh, that is vanishing. And the average regret being vanishing means that the gap between what my algorithm achieved over t time steps on average is getting not much worse than the best possible function in hindsight could have achieved. And we know that essentially like this, this is kind of saying that my benchmark is still the batch benchmark. If the data had appeared, I could have sort of still applied all that black box and what we saw on the first slide here. But the data didn't appear this way, and I still want to be able to pretend as if, as if I'm doing as well as I could have done if it was a batch data. And by now, we know that these problems can be solved, especially in full information setting. We actually understand them really well. Um, for decades, we have been under being able to understand them. Um, we know that when the function class is finite, you can get square root of log of h over t. Uh, this was a, a celebrated result of Freund and Shapiri. And also when the class is not finite, uh, this optimal achievable regret is defined by something called the Littlestone dimension. And this was a result of Ben David Paul and um, Shell Shorts. It doesn't really matter what this little sun dimension is. I just want to put it here. Throughout the talk, I'm not really going to talk about it. Whenever it matters, I'll actually tell you how to think about it. But more importantly, we know how to solve these problems. But the algorithms, all of these algorithms that can solve this type of problem, importantly, are not computationally efficient. They're, in fact, nothing like their batch perspective. It's, it's not that black box. I don't just try to optimize something that looked good historically. I have to redesign these algorithms. And the design of them tends to be computationally inefficient and have really bad overhead. So what we really want to do in this talk is not to design things from scratch. Instead, try to repurpose whatever insights we've gained from batch optimization and then import them to sequential optimization. Essentially, we're going to assume that that ERM oracle, the black box that we had here, is really a black box. 
And I am going to try to get that black, black box. I'm going to call it an ERM oracle. And only using that black box, get sequential optimization, no regret algorithms. OK? So this is called an Oracle efficient online learning. And there are many reasons we would want these types of algorithms. The first reason is that, as I said, previous algorithms overall were inefficient. How inefficient? Typically, they needed to keep track of the performance of each function that was available to the learner. And these functions tend to be exponential. Like, let me give you an example of this. We were talking about potentially setting reserve prices as an application of online learning. So if I have many items, if I'm trying to set their prices, reserve prices all independently, then the number of functions that I have is exponential in the number of items, um, even if I could just like set their prices to be like high or low. Another way to think about this is if I was dealing with binary classification, um, I might have only K different features that I care about, but even knowing what each of these features should be high or low, again, I have at least two to the K number of functions to worry about. So we really don't want to explicitly think about number of functions or functions available to, to the learner. Instead, we want to be able to use these ERM oracles to access those functions. So this is really the first reason, the fact that those algorithms were computationally inefficient. Now, it's only useful, <laughs> this perspective, if my batch optimization, that ERM oracle, is actually either theoretically or practically more efficient, because otherwise, why am I going to use it? And this is typically the case both in theory and practice, or at least in one of them. So usually, when it is the case in theory, it's because the, the format of batch optimization it was itself very nice and lent itself to polynomial time computation. This is the case, for example, if you could solve the problem with a linear program or with a number of other things we know how to optimize um, provably with computationally efficient algorithms. But even if actually we don't have those types of algorithms, what's happened is that because we've really cared about batch optimization for decades, we have developed really good tools for doing that, even when theory sort of fell short of doing it. So one example of this is that Integer programming, uh, program solving prob um, um, softwares have got really, really good over the years. So you can solve integer programs occasionally like really fast and really well, but uh, even though they're not technically speaking computationally efficient algorithms. So this is another reason to want to be able to reduce your problem to something that can be solved with these existing batch optimization. Lastly, I think this is a bit of a philosophical question, too. Um, when we started this whole talk was that the world is changing, and it's becoming more strategic. It's becoming more interactive, um, sometimes for economic reasons, sometimes for other reasons, just unpredictable evolution of data. So what we are asking here is that how much do we need to actually completely redo all of our insights, completely redo all of our intuition and tools to adjust to this new world? If new insights or completely like new insights that need to be built from scratch are not needed, we can then reserve our energy to really think about those problems that need to be addressed from scratch. So this is important to know how different is computation for strategic agents versus computation for agents that are not necessarily strategic? They're more sort of predictable coming from some distributions. So these are three reasons for which we should really be asking if Oracle efficient online algorithms exist or not. OK, let me take a second to make sure um, you have a chance to ask any questions you might have. Um, any questions kind of? whether technically so far or philosophically or about where we are going to be headed. Yes. Every time when you, uh, at every time step, you're going to treat that. 
So that we are re-optimizing the same thing over and over. It's a great question. So what you're asking is that assume I have a batch optimization oracle. How are you going to use it? I have dedicated my next slide to actually talking about some uh, naive to not so naive ways of using it. So I'll come to that in a minute and then I'll come back to you to see if that made sense. So far, everything has been quite abstract because we haven't actually started looking at these in depth. Yes. Will we factor in like the size of the problem? So we submit. That's a great question. So what I put in this uh, green box is very hand wavy. Uh, what does it mean to just get uh, batch optimization and then efficiently solve a no regret algorithm? Couple things go into this. So um, I'm not gonna go too much into depth, but let me just tell you. Things you can do is call an oracle, a polynomial many times. What happens, I'll give you recipes that essentially you're only calling an oracle once per time step or twice per time step, no more than that. So you don't need to worry about it. The second aspect is the amount of effort you need to put into calling this oracle, which is how much input am I creating for it? Um, also has to be polynomial in the number of time steps and parameters of interest, essentially. So you shouldn't do exponential amount of work <laughs> and then call an oracle, or you shouldn't create infinitely large data set and then call an oracle on that. So those are essentially the two ways to think about it. Good news is, as I said, we'll only call it once or twice per round. And uh, the data sets we create are uh, very obviously going to be bounded in size and in a in nice space. Other questions? Yes. Um, you've got cases where you, you only call like logarithmic log 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 in, in the like length of the horizon as opposed to just like each time step. That's a good question. Um, the question is, is it necessary to call an oracle once per round, or can I call it even less than that? Um, logarithmic, I believe, is not enough. Um, you could call it square root, I believe, like polynomial, but smaller than that. But we are not going to worry about it. Essentially, running time-wise, I'm not trying to optimize this too much. I do care a lot about what regret I get about this. But if you want to call it once per round, I'm happy um, with that. But that, that's a really good, quick question. So like, how, how much can you like push this? Uh, do, you, do you want to work with, under assumption of like, the same Oracle at all times or, yeah? Sure. Yeah. We take the Oracle as a black box. So we don't actually ever use anything about it other than the fact that it has the ability to do some, like optimize over whatever input I give it. I'll formalize that also in the next slide. Other questions? Okay, so the, there was a really good question, which was um, how do you even use these ERM oracles? And this is a type of exercise that we might repeat a couple of times during uh, the, the talk today, which is um, we'll talk about things that might appear very naive um, and then try to make them more and more reasonable. So let's, let's, you're going to see the first example of this here. So first of all, what is an oracle? Just, just in case it wasn't clear so far, an oracle is something that can do this type of a computation. It can take a data set S, and it knows some loss function it's trying to minimize. And then it finds a function whose cumulative loss is as little as possible. Now, kind of. To just make this a little bit easier, I think it's best to think about binary classification. So this loss is just going to be an error that you might make on an instance. And uh, the instance Z itself is um, a feature vector and a label. Um, feature vector could be like an image of a cat or dog or chair or table and whether or not it was one of those things. So what you're going to do is to think about a number of ways you might want to call an oracle. What is one way of calling an oracle per round? What should it be the input of it? No suggestion. It doesn't have to be a good suggestion. As I said, we are going to start naive. 
run it on the data so far? Run it on the data so far. That's actually the second most naive solution because the most naive solution is the one that none of you would probably want to say it out loud, but I want to put it out here, which is the thing that's impossible to do. If I knew the future, maybe I could have just run it on the future. Okay. Why none of you wanted to say it? It's because it's impossible. This is way too much wishful thinking. But Viva's right. The second thing that we could do is to call it on what you've seen so far. That's, that's actually quite reasonable. Um, anyone wants to argue why this is not a very good idea? In presence of an adversary? You can suffer. Is the best is not suffering. Right. What happens here is that, for one thing, this is a deterministic type of algorithm. And whenever you're dealing with an adversary, it's a bad idea being deterministic because they can make sure that you pay the next. Like they know what you're going to do and then they can make you pay for it. So this is also a bad idea because while it's doable, it uh, has large effect. OK, now that we know that this, these are bad ideas, uh, what is one stuff that's slightly better than this? In particular, I said we need to avoid determinism. Any suggestions? You want to pass the data plus some random function. Right. So the next suggestion is well, I have the past data. Let me append to that some random stuff. And what those random stuff are, I don't know right now. This is something to be discussed later. But nevertheless, I'm just going to sort of add something. And this is OK. Um, this is, in fact, one of two ways of doing this type of uh, adding data. Another way of thinking about hallucinating some future data, and a lot more subtle why you could use something that looks like this, is that instead of learning a function, you could think about just directly making a prediction about a function, uh, about an instance. So one way to do that is that you have your past, you have your future, and you have the instance you're asked to make a new prediction on. And then you say, well, how would have my ERM done if I predicted plus on it versus I pred predicted minus on it? And that kind of tells you the sensitivity of how important it is to predict plus or minus. So you could kind of use the gap between the two to decide with po what probability you should be predicting one and with po what probability you should be predicting minus one. Okay? This is just two different ways of using these future data points that aren't necessarily future, but something that you randomly guessed. There was a question here. Would it matter? Uh, and so, like, more settings, uh, if you use the sign of this gap or the actual size of the gap? Um, when this, okay, when, when, when this loss is not a binary loss necessarily, it's real value, things get a little bit hairy. So if you're interested in that, I will tell you to like read more and I'll give citations here. Is that a question? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that, uh, you know, just using all the past data deterministically has large regret in part because of the determinism. Are there ways to introduce uh, randomness and not need to hallucinate future data, like some something something bootstrap something something? There, there are some ways. We are not going to be talking about them because they don't probably work for or efficiency for large function classes. You can thin your history, but for this approach has been used in some online algorithm design, especially when you want to like preserve sparsity or some specific property of history. But we won't be talking about it at all. OK, so let me just assign name to this, this second, the third, second and third approach. This is optimization over past and a hallucinated future. Hallucinated because there's no reason these SIs that you are sort of cooking up have anything to do with the future. And these two lines of work, the first one is the follow the perturbator style of uh, argument and algorithm design. Introduced by Kalaya Mampala, has a long history of being used in many different settings. The second one has different names, but uh, one popular name for it is relaxed and randomized. 
um, has been used, uh, introduced by Rockman, Sridharan, and Shamir, and again, has been also used in many, many different settings. Both of them um, together, I think, have revolutionized what we think about sequential decision. Okay, so by now, there should be one obvious question in your mind, which is that I'm talking about hallucinations, but what are these hallucinations? So this is what you're wondering. And if you're wondering how to hallucinate, good news is no substance is unnecessary. And we will talk about this. Essentially, there are technical points we'll talk about, not at mathematical depth, but briefly, which is how, what is this distribution you should be sampling from? Um, what if, if I don't know the future, why does it matter if I can hallucinate it if it doesn't look like the future? And if I know something about the future, then how is this any better? Okay. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what is known. So there is the worst case regime and beyond worst case regime. In worst case regime, there is, a, there is unfortunately a gap, as in what is statistically achievable in regret is not computationally achievable. So even if I give you an oracle, you cannot get a no regret algorithm whenever that oracle was working for the stochastic setting. But there are sort of slivers of hope for certain classes, like if the loss is linear, if it has small domain, or if it's structured in other ways, we kind of know how to get these oracle efficient results. Okay. Now, the interesting thing here is that the picture is very different when you go beyond worst case. And we'll talk about what a beyond worst case world looks like. Importantly, there is no significant gap between what is statistically achievable and what you can achieve with Oracle efficiency. Okay. Both of them are going to be defined by something called the VC dimension and the time step. And something is, which is about what is a worse, beyond worst case um, a type of an adversary, like how much better than worst case you are. This dependence is not the same, um, but it's, it's interesting that there is no significant gap between the two. Um, there is a concurrent work that also gets this type of result. The regrets doesn't quite match ours, but you can still think about both of these work as really thinking about collapsing this hierarchy and showing that there is no gap. But the good thing about here is that when your regret is really nice, like the type of regret we can get, not only you say something for beyond worst case adversaries, actually you get to imply things even for worst case adversaries under some functional assumptions, like if the domain was small, small or some other knowledge was there. For this talk, I'm going to focus here only and really tell you a little bit about what is a model of beyond worst case adversary, what is one statistical tool that helps us in getting statistically optimal regret, and at a high level, how does it help us with the computational aspect? Okay, so on to what is a smooth, um, what is a beyond worst case adversary? And here we are going to take the perspective of smooth analysis if you're familiar with that perspective. If not, I'm going to introduce it. You essentially have a function class. This, everything is as before. You have a learner and you have a world. The only thing that changes is that the world is not fully adversarial. The data is generated from a distribution DT. The adversary is only setting this distribution DT per round. And this distribution DT is sigma smooth. What is sigma smooth? It's a distribution whose max density is upper bounded by some, some one over sigma times the density of the uniform distribution. Um, you can vary this sigma. If sigma was zero, you don't have any smoothness. It could be fully adversarial because there is no upper bound. If sigma was some uh, number, then uh, essentially you're getting the adversary to move closer and closer and closer to the uniform distribution. You still are interested in the same definition of regret, what your algorithm gets versus what the best function would have gotten. Another way to think about this is that the world and an adversary or adversary and the nature are working together to create an instance. The adversary picks one and then sort of the world adds some noise to it and then we get it. So this is smooth analysis. Uh, and why do we actually care about smooth analysis? It's because sometimes there's a really big gap between what's adversarially achievable and what's um, stochastically achievable. And whenever there is a big gap, 
smooth analysis tells you which one of the two ends is more realistic. And I'm going to show you why there is a big gap in online sequential decision making. And we'll do this really quickly because I know most of you have seen this. But for those of you who haven't, we are playing a binary search game, essentially. There is a threshold beyond it. There is a positive below it. Everything is negative. And I'm asking you to label points. Me, I'm the adversary. You're the one who has to design the algorithm. And I'll ask you to label a, like point half. And sort of no matter what you say, if you say it's positive or negative, I'm going to disagree with you. And I tell you that you made a mistake. And then I'm going to continue this, asking you for a quarter or three quarter if I was on the other side. And we'll continue playing this game. You'll say something, I'll disagree with you, and we'll continue until the end of time because there is no end of time. We can continue this infinitely deep. And what happens is here that there would have been a function that would have been perfect on whatever the adversary claimed to be true, but the algorithm made a mistake at every round. So this is why sequential decision making has, is not possible if your function class is, is infinitely large, it's not possible to get a no-regret algorithm. So you should really think about this as having this type of a tree that is creating a problem for you. Now, this is telling you that being dealing with an adaptive adversary is impossible. So the question is, then why did the fully stochastic setting work? We all know that stochasticity and learning work well together. And really the idea here is that there is a, something defined by net that I can set the granularity of my problem rather than looking at infinite function classes, I can sort of put a grid on them and not consider all functions, only consider some of them. What does this look like? If this was a distribution, and I, of the instances that were stochastically arriving, I could only consider functions, like just think about functions at a one epsilon, at a epsilon granularity, this epsilon being the amount of distribution under my curve. And then each function is pretty close to its proxy. What that means is that no distribution can consider too many of its points into any of these gaps, because these gaps are by definition small part of the distribution. And this anti-concentration is the reason we can learn in stochastic settings. And it's exactly the lack of this anti-concentration that becomes a problem. I cannot define a net until the game is finished because the final net is the one that is being made in the future steps. And the adversary can decide where to focus its points and therefore create this net, keep changing sort of what I think about what the net is going to be. So what could have helped in this scenario? Well, as I said, we're going to start by naive things that look like wishful thinkings and then get to more doable scenarios. So the naive thing is that, well, if I knew the future instances, I could have created a net. That would have been great. But actually, the next naive step is that I don't need to know the future instances. I just kind of need to know the cumulative distribution. In fact, I, I really just needed to know what the final net would have looked like. In fact, I don't even need to know the net. If I could generate instances from that cumulative distribution into the future, then I could sort of think about a net on those instances. And that would have been a net for my future. So this is starting to look more like maybe we can actually do this. In fact, I don't even need to know the instances or net or distribution. Another way to think about it is that I just need to have a pretty good sense of what instances I'm going to see. Let's say maybe I had a superset of all the future instances and the superset wasn't huge. Like it kind of, it actually included information about the points I was going to see in the future. Because I, I could use this to, in fact, if I had a superset of instances in the future, I could use it to create some kind of a pessimistic net and it would have become more and more pessimistic the larger the superset would be. In fact, Really what I care about is I just care to be able to generate instances that look like they would have been the superset of future instances. What do I mean? I really mean that I just want to be able to generate a bunch of instances, not too many of them. And sort of statistically speaking, I could have imagined a world that they would have been a superset of the adverse response. Okay, I have weakened 
my wishful thinking to the point that is exactly essentially what you're going to show. So to summarize, what is it we are trying to do? We are trying to preserve anti-concentration over a sequence of smooth distributions. And it's not hard to do it at one round because each distribution is smooth, it's anti-concentrated. Really the challenge is to deal with their correlations. So this is exactly what we do. And uh, in two works kind of refining this idea, we can think about coupling an adaptive adversary with a uniform distributions. So what do I mean? I mean that there is a joint distribution between these two worlds. One world is the adversarial world and the other world is the uniform stochastic world. Where in the adversarial world, I'm taking T instances from whatever that adaptive adversary did. And in the uniform world, I'm getting a little bit more samples. I'm taking T, almost T over sigma number of samples. And importantly, with high probability, the, whatever the adversary would have generated would have been a subset of what I generated from the uniform distribution. So this is true. You can prove this with rejection sampling. I'm not going to prove it. You can do it as a take home exercise. Um, but kind of why is this useful? Why is this useful? Well, it's useful because Essentially, uniform distribution is like a gold standard of not being concentrated. So if I take a lot of points, um, if I want, let's say that I want to say that these points are the, whatever the adversary created wasn't concentrated, it's sufficient to say that a superset of them was not concentrated. And if that superset tends to be a uniform distribution, IID, we know that it's not going to be concentrated because uniform IID is the best I can hope for. So this is a high level idea that we are going to connect an adaptive smooth adversary to a uniform world and say that an adaptive smooth adversary cannot be much worse than the stochastic adversary on a slightly different timeline. Why does this help me? If I didn't care about computation, this helps me in creating the nets. In fact, one way to think about it is that I could just take a net with respect to the uniform distribution. And this is a reasonably good net because I, I, I don't want the adversary to be able to put too many points in here out of the T points. And guess what? I created a superset of those points. And if the superset of them cannot concentrate, then the subset of them was not going to concentrate. So this is very simple. This allows me to create nets that are actually really nice. And this is really the, the punchline of how you can get statistically optimal algorithms that only depend on the VC dimension and nicely depend on T and one over sigma. Very high level idea. So I can create nets. It's not that hard to create nets. But computationally speaking, I don't want to create nets because nets are expensive. That was the whole point of our conversation. So if it's expensive, I must be doing this implicitly and not explicitly. What are some ideas here? Well, I'm going to, again, maybe think a little bit more naively. What I know is that if I knew the future, that the thing that would have never happened, I would have never needed to make a net. There's no reason to make a net because the future itself is defining my net essentially implicitly. So if that's the case, intuitively, what you're trying to do here is to say that maybe my hallucinations will create the net for me. What does that look like? Well, imagine for a second that I truly gave you some points that I promised will include the future. If you just put that in your ERM, the hope, hope is going to be that this ERM is not going to require, like I, I'm not doing any net computation. This by itself is going to concentrate nicely. Now, to be fair, 
I might not have access to these things. I can only hallucinate something that would have been coupled with whatever the adversary creates in the future. And that maybe is okay too, because I can still do this type of a computation and there would have been a world, like statistically speaking, that would have included, this would have been a superset of what the adversaries generate. This is the intuitive idea. If I don't want to have nets and I want to work with oracles, then it's okay as long as what I'm generating and I'm putting into my future looks like statistically could have included, could have been a pessimistic approximation of my actual future. Yes. There is something really subtle here that that's going on here because if I had just more random data from uniform distribution, I would wash out my data. So it's like, I can't really just like- Yeah. So I can tell you two things that's happening here. So let's go here because that would have happened here as well. Um, if I have so much data, uh, it's not just washing out that's going to happen. Is that I'm going to have a much more pessimistic view of this approximation because T over sigma is entering. It's like like the regret is getting worse the longer the sequence is getting. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is something I'm not going to talk about on the slide, but I'm going to tell you here which is that generally speaking, when you introduce noise, um, two things is happening. You're stabilizing what your algorithm is doing as in it's not like radically changing from one step to the next, but you're sort of adding a lot of regularization that's taking it farther and farther. And you need to kind of nicely balance these two. I'll, I have one more slide that has an epsilon more mathematical intuition and I'll talk about that again there. Any other questions? I know that this is quite high level. Okay. That's a great question. That's that's another okay. That's a, that's another great way of thinking about this. Is that I'm being more naive than I need to be. In particular, um, this sequence that I'm creating should really depend on how many more steps I have left, right? So you could think about this as your t minus t capital T minus little t. And it's true. As you get closer to the end, you should shrink the number of stochastic things that you're creating, okay? So I am heavily simplifying the actual algorithm because the actual algorithm also makes some other noise here, okay? Uh, I just have a question about the Is the goal of this hallucination to be unpredictable or to regularize? Or both? Depends on what you think about the future. If I knew the future, I don't need to create any more unpredictability about the future. So the goal of this is to capture something about the future. But when the future is completely adversarial, it's essentially the only thing it can do is to be completely random and completely unpredictable. Okay. It is a regularization, but the intuition for why you want to regularize is more about why you wish that you knew what the future is going to look like. It is, it is, a, it, it is regularization. It's just, it's, it's a different perspective. If the future was fixed, it would have been a different purpose for us. One more question, and then I'll continue. I, I don't know who was first. Uh, you can go. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think it's related to the previous two questions, but uh, like uh, as you approach more that precise setting, you are having to create exponentially large number of uh, observations for the ERM, and uh, you promise less exponential. Oh, uh, yeah, I. I, the, the regret will depend on the one of our sigmas. So oh, you cannot cheat. Okay. There is oh, no, okay. there is no way you're going Sorry. to cheat. Yes, I, yes. I'll, I'll give you the exact. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I want to give this mathematical explanation, even though I have only. Can I take more? Can I take five? There, there was a lot of questions. Okay, and I think this is, this is actually interesting here. Um, 
So what are we saying here? I said that I'm what I just I just want to tell you that this is kind of believable without giving you mathematical reasoning for this. What happened? I essentially used the coupling to turn T interactions with an adversary to T over sigma interactions with a uniform distribution. And the idea is that if regret just got worse and worse, the longer the sequence or the bigger the sequence became, superset, I mean, longer the superset today, then I kind of have already really proved this by saying that the regret would have become only worse by increasing the, the sequence. And this sequence would have a regret that is at most this much. The issue is that regret is technically speaking not mo exactly monotone. It, there's something else that's actually monotone. And that is something called essentially Rademacher complexity. I'm not going to say what it is, but it's a proxy upper and lower bound for regret. And that is monotone for in this set. So the more you have, the worse it becomes. There's a second issue, which is that, again, this a AIs are only kind of stochastically including these ZIs. And again, this, there is a resolution here, which is that just because as constructing the nets didn't really care about instances, care about distribution, something very similar is happening. Both Rademacher complexity and this reasoning doesn't really care about instances, they care about stochasticity. Is it classical Rademacher complexity or the sequential? It's interesting. It is classical, but it's regularized. And if I were to give you, just because you're one of the experts, to give you why what's happening here is that we are using a classical Rademacher complexity regularized by the past as an admissible um, relaxation of the future with these uniforms. That might have been things that didn't make sense to everyone. But what are the regret results? And that's what I mean that you cannot cheat. The regret result I gave you has a one over sigma dependence. Kind of depends whether it's a binary classification or not uh, a little bit. And the main reason that it matters if it's binary or not is that how I define smoothness. If I define smoothness over the whole set, it's slightly different. Just because I didn't, I, I'm not necessarily saying that uh, the label smoothed, then if I allowed sort of real values here, there's no chance ZP is smoothed. So it's mostly because of these technical ways of defining it. You can really believe that the binary one is the correct one to think about. I'm going to skip this. There is an interesting way of improving to get this square root of one over sigma. And I'm not able to tell you, but I hope that we can allocate a whiteboard deep discussion to it. And I will volunteer my graduate students to lead it because it's an interesting way of thinking about modified way of thinking about generalization. Um, lastly, I do want to say that uh, there is still a gap. Statistically speaking, you could have done this logarithmically. So really what we did here was that we wanted to be robust to sort of T interactions within beyond worst case adversary. And both the classical algorithms and analysis, both in terms of oracles and nets, statistically and computationally, came together to help us do this. And this is really the beauty of smooth analysis, that you can really get rid of the worst part of an adversary and bring it back to the stochastic world, but make all of those results much more robust. So they don't need exact stochasticity. They can essentially work in the adversarial world, except when the adversary is a little bit more reasonable. OK, I'll end here. Uh, thank you for being here and uh, for the questions. OK, thanks. Yeah, I'm going to